now beginning, beginning of a session uh, with uh, Mrs. Anupa Arupa, I'm sorry, Lahiri, who is not only an accomplished dancer, choreographer, art director, but uh, also happens to be the regional director of the Indira Gandhi National Center of the Arts in Baroda. So uh, she has uh, considerable expertise in Indian performing arts and Indian arts uh, in, in the larger sense. And uh, therefore, when I approached her to speak of how Sanskrit survives in some of these, uh, in fact, many and almost of these art traditions, she readily agreed. And uh, she will be focusing more particularly on two narrative traditions, one from Kerala and one from Assam, and illustrating the, the theme of our course. So we are very thankful for you know, accepting our invitation and uh, we'll now listen to you. So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for inviting me here. As a dancer, we are asked not to speak. And as for the brief stint, I have been teaching uh, young professionals like you all, uh, from the humanities background. So as a professor, I have I have always spoken. So this is a very, uh, you know, oxymoronic trait in me where uh, I need to speak or not to speak is what we need to, I, I have always needed to decide in my life. And um, brevity is something that I would like to practice. So today's lecture is brief and also taking me out of my own expertise area because I'm a classical dancer. But the subject that I have chosen to speak about are two folk styles or if I may correct, because this is something that I'm going to break down during my lecture is two regional practices from two corners of India, almost two opposite corners of India, one from Kerala and the other from Assam. Neither of them I practice. So why did I select this? Because it has always been my fascination. And, you know, uh, <clears throat> I, I think IIT uh, organizations like IIT also teaches you to be out of the box and to go beyond, to push yourself beyond your comfort zone. And this is something that I have been doing throughout my life. And it has always interested me. The, the so-called folk traditions have always had a very strong pull on me because I always wanted to interact and see what makes folk folk and classical classical. So let me begin with this. Uh, before delving into a detailed discussion of the traditions, we need to understand or begin with a question of what is classical and what is folk. Now, Bharatanatyam, for example, you must, I, I presume you have heard about Bharatanatyam. And not like uh, those sessions where I have gone and danced for an hour and then somebody gets up and said, Madam, you have done a lot of So uh, can, I, uh, can I begin with very simple, basic, fundamental questions? Not to run down anybody, but just to know that I, where I stand. Okay, so what is Bharatanatyam? Where is, what is Bharatanatyam? Any, anybody? Let's have a dialogue here. Anybody? Class. Right. Absolutely correct. So you used a term classical, okay? So what makes this dance form classical? Can you, can anybody answer? What, what do you think makes it classical? The expressions, okay. So you believe that the expressions is something that makes a classical art form, thank you. A classical art form classical. Anything else? Uh, Ma'am, um, I think... Uh, Okay, so yes. uh, ma'am, I think uh, you need to get yourself trained when you are practicing something which is classical and it differentiates itself from other forms. So for so, me, uh, so yes. picking up from your uh, answer, Sneha, it, uh, you, you said it is uh, training that makes yes, ma'am, uh, this represents our culture also. Okay, anything that represents culture. Okay, so <clears throat> we are going to keep a tab on these um, key words that you are using. One is, uh, you said expression. Second one, you said uh, training. Third one, you said represents culture. And Mana, you wanted to say something. Hmm. 
Mm. Okay, so the practice is rooted in classical texts which are hundreds of year old. So these are the four keywords uh, we have got. Please keep them in mind because uh, we will see that we will see what happens with these keywords. Okay, so uh, who decides? Who decides what is classical? Next question is that. Um, is there, a, you know, a ministry body which decides that this is classical? Is Was there a king who decided that this is classical? Was, uh, you know, was it written in some sort of a text that this is going to be classical? Who do you think decides? Any, I, I welcome any answer, okay? No answer is a wrong answer for me. Who decides? This is uh, actually, ma'am. Uh, people and uh, the the representatives of the societies decides. I think uh, this is, you know, uh, classical, right. which which actually shows uh, uh, the expressions of our uh, uh, specific kind of uh, uh, specific regions culture. Sorry, I, I didn't catch on the last uh, part of your uh, sentence. Uh, actually, uh, the, the people who represents a specific region's culture and uh, they uh, their expressions and their dance forms, uh, they can say that this is the, some classical kind of uh, dance which uh, represents, our, uh, represents a specific place. So important, so if I can, I may translate you what you were saying, important people from regional, uh, yes. uh, region from different pockets of region decides that this is good enough to be classical or this is, the, it follows certain rules to become classical, right? Have I got you right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Right, brilliant. So uh, I think again and again, there is something that is coming up. Texts, treaties, um, rules, these are the words which are coming up again and again in our conversation that we are having so far. So is it only adherence to certain rules or certain, uh, to a certain treatise like Nati Shastra that makes it classical? The, is it Nati Shastra that tells us what is classical and what is folk? So many a times classical is interchangeably used with a word called marg or margam, okay? Margam, refers to, as we all know, a path or a road. And parallel to the usage of the word marg, we have a word which is popularly called desi, okay, which refers to a certain concept which we understand as regional. So now I will ask you, is regional, by basic English knowledge, is regional opposite to a path? No. Region geographically represents a wider space and path is something which is very uh, you know, it is it is maintained, it is uh, decided, pre-decided that this is going to be a path, whereas a region is a much larger geographic space that we are talking about. So we cannot have these as antonyms to each other is what we understand, okay? Then, so, <clears throat> so what they see, the word they see refers to whatever we understand as all aspects of art that is spontaneous, not intentionally planned out or non-codified. These are the things that we have come to understood by the term desi. During the later half of the 20th century, the term started getting reassigned. Uh, desi became associated with folk and marg became associated with classical. Folk in turn started getting associated with concepts like rural, hence unsophisticated, often ritualistic, mass entertaining, humorous, crude. These were the words that started getting associated with what we understand as folk today. Classical, on the other hand, being diametrically opposite, became started associating itself with class, code, sophistication, consciously learned form. Somebody mentioned that we have to learn it for a certain number of years to call it classical. A structured pattern is what we come to understand as classical. 
It is very interesting to note that, however, these ideas are constantly evolving. They are not the ideas that are constant or fixed. They are not ideas that have been handed down to us through treaties, as we will very soon realize. Let me uh, draw your attention to one particular text people from South of India must have heard about it called Silapati Karam. You, uh, anybody has heard about Silapati Karam? Yes, what is it? It is uh, not a Sangam work. It is a, it's a, it's a, it's one of the Tamil epics. And very interestingly, this epic is not about a hero. That is the best thing that, uh, you know, people who, uh, who we talk about, you know, the, we talk about the woman power, we talk about uh, feminism as a movement. We need to visit this particular text to see how ordinary this story is. It is about a very ordinary couple and the, the you know, it is uh, as like most of the epics, it is a starstruck couple who uh, cannot, you know, do not spend much time together. And then there are uh, there are two heroines and one hero in that particular story. So there is uh, Kanegi, who is the main uh, protagonist. There is uh, Kovalan and then there is Madhavi. Now, Madhavi is a classical dancer. She's a courtesan. So her debut performance lists certain items. It's very interestingly written in Silpati Karam. And of the 11 items that she does, she doesn't have a Pushpanjali, Varnam, Tillana, uh, Padam, Javali. All the things that we hear nowadays were not part of her repertoire of what she does. Instead, we get to hear something like Tolpava. Tol, tolpava. Uh, anybody knows who is what is a Tolpava? Yes, tol means skin. So, okay. So, tol pavi. Then she had a uh, kurakuta. Kurakuta is what we know as karagatam nowadays. Okay, putting a pot of water on your head and dancing with it. And she also does um, marakalatam. Marakalatam is with wooden legs. So, so is tol pavi a folk dance or a classical dance? Folk. Okay. Uh, is... Um, uh, Karagatam, a classical dance or a folk dance? Folk. Okay, so, so three items, definitely what we spoke about is folk was done by Madhavi, who was a classical dancer. Okay, so this is, so from the very beginning, and this is not a new text, this is not something that is written now. So we see breaking down of our notions of what is folk, what is classical, okay? And very easily she was, her expertise was challenged by these pieces which she presented with great you know aplomb and she was uh, she was very good with that however they were part of the her arangetam and they were performed in court space she did not go out and perform in the village in front of temple okay she performed it in the court space so that is a classical space as we understand it so this is what is happening again and again now we can understand that these dynamics are not fixed it is much later in works like Nritya Ratnavali that we see chronicles of those forms that were borrowed from Desi tradition. And this happens also with the Bharatanatyam repertoire. When the Tanjavur brothers started creating what we know as Margam today, they borrowed and they selected and they created what was the crispest of all the pieces that were taught. Were taught. At one point of time, not too long ago, you know, about... Uh, Say about 30, 40 years ago, there was something called a Pamba dance. Okay. Pamba dance used to be, I, I think uh, Dr. Reddy will be able to tell that there was, this was supposed to be a dance that imitated movements of snake. And it had high, uh, it needed flexibility as its key factor. So this dance was very much part of the Arangetram repertoire when a child of about 12 or 11 year old who was flexible enough to bend backwards and have the head touching the toe could perform. But nowadays nobody is doing it. So it has become, it is going out slowly and slowly and it is becoming part of the folk tradition as it, as you will call it. There are many, there is uh, these, um, uh, songs uh, which are sung by uh, Korati, okay, gypsies that were part of the repertoire. 
and now it is going out of the system. So these concepts of classical and folk is an evolving concept. It is not a fixed concept. And that is what I will be drawing through my lecture. I will be drawing your attention to again and again. Mind you, I'm not a practitioner of Otam Thullal. I'm not a practitioner of Ojapali. But when and as I have interacted with these forms, I have realized that there is these quote unquote compartments are not to be considered the benchmarks for evolve for uh, uh, it it should not color our glasses when we look at these forms okay then so uh, what um, as i was talking about that these are so so what is what is art what is art art is basically anukarana or imitation of life that is when you see life you imitate it and but as uh, there is a, there is a scholar I greatly uh, admire and respect called uh, Satavdhani Ganesh. He says that art should be having something called Swabhavukti. It should have something. Interestingly, before we come to understand that what is it, we understand that Swabhavukti or spontaneity is related to Lokadharmi and Vakrukti is related to Natyadharmi. It is, these are, now I have introduced two more terms. Natya Dharmi and Loka Dharmi. Till now, I was only using two words, that is Desi and Mari. Okay. Now, there are two more terms, which are Loka Dharmi and Natya Dharmi. So, these will come again and again when we talk about classical and folk. What are these? Are these interchangeable terms? We need to understand and look at these that, that regional forms are not very far away from the knowledge base or the Sanskrit treaties. So that is something that will contradict Manner's statement that classical is related to Sanskrit treaties. Okay, Art is thus created from the raw material that we gather from life because Anukarana follows life, but it moves from life to impersonal emotions. So it is not enough. If I see something like, for example, we were sitting in the canteen and something somebody falls and we laugh hilariously. That is life. Okay. But when we walk on stage, we just can't laugh ha 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 like that. Okay. That cannot just happen. So there is a decorum, there is an auchitya in art. And when art moves from imitation to a impersonal emotion. So now no longer am I connected to that incident then that becomes art, okay? Then, very often while understanding art, the following terms are very loosely used. Marga with classical, with Brahmanical tradition, with Vedic knowledge. Similarly, on the opposite side, we have Desi, which is associated with folk, which is associated with Sudravarna and non-Vedic knowledge. Earlier, Marga and Desi were not tied to Varnas and Vedas. Neither were they associated with the concepts of astika or nastika. Okay, so today the worshippers of Devi, Shiva, Ganesha has come into mainstream, and people who worship them has become astik, and people who do manasa puja have gone to the realm of non-sophisticated, crude, um, ignorant, dark, doesn't have intelligence, that kind of a uh, section. This leads us to debate on the word Shastra. What is Shastra? Shastra refers to a very well-structured presentation with novel insights, or it is a work with qualities of Shasana. Okay, you are familiar with the word Shasana. You understand what Shasana means, right? So it means to govern or to rule. And it comes from the root word Shasu Anu, anu Shishtasu. This, these are, this is the root word that is used from where Shasana comes. To govern means to protect. And what, what image comes to your mind when I say to protect, to govern, what comes to your mind? Powerful, a kingly character, right? So like a king, Shastra is almost like that in our mind. So however, a king cannot be a dictator. We know that. The minute a king becomes dictator, he is not fit to rule because he has to be governed by, he is controlled by something which is called dharma. So every shastra is governed by what we understand a principle or a dharma. Such dharma 
is inspired by in turn the dharma what is dharma what is what do we understand by this word called dharma is it something very heavy very boring what like this what is this concept of dharma dharma is something which has come from the cosmic order something which is not dependent on you me changing circumstances it is dependent on the cons, uh, cosmic order and something which we say as the absolute truth or satya okay shastra is also like a bridge between pratibha and panditya now what is pratibha and panditya these two concepts are like two fundamental pillars of indian art and performing arts indian arts and aesthetics is pratibha related to natural talent or is panditya related to acquired knowledge so then does panditya become classical and pratibha becomes folk is it is that what happens art is something which is spontaneous we say that great masters of art when we when we get up on stage it it has to be spontaneous it has to be something that is happening at that point of time on stage so every time an artist performs he or she improvises it but if the improvisation happens at an accelerated rate say for example today morning i put a a block of brick here next morning you see a building and the third morning you come back to rubble that is such acceleration that it disturbs reality so linearity of fun like linearity of logic is very very important to create reality as we understand it so that is when art needs something like shastra to control it to give it that linear progress like for example i it's very disturbing you know when you walk into a um, into a an auditorium and the sitar player because we have a sitar player in the audience today so i'm referring to it starts with a jhala and goes back to an ala that is disturbing your linearity and that's where the shastra or the code or uh, the rules that we were talking about comes in that is where you need this kind of a thing okay then so art if i may say is an expression of an experience and shastra is the exposition of that ex uh, expression okay so these two are interrelated now that makes us wonder that who is an artist or how is an artist created is it if i say that uh, i will start teaching nelson okay my staff Sh bharatanatyam shastra so can two months later nelson become bharatanatyam artist is it possible then he is don't don't think about uh, oh two months is not enough to learn no don't think like that but if you learn if if i learn uh, a subject okay can i become a subject expert yes right if i learn a subject i become a subject expert isn't it i learn mathematics today tomorrow i am a mathematician isn't it that's how it is but then why if you learn an art you cannot become an artist tell me this is a question this is a question come i'll i'll teach you something here uh you have just raise your right hand the fingers you join them this is called a bud okay it is i'll also give you the terminology of this this is called mukulam okay now if you open the fingers it's called alapadma it means a flower now i can teach you this but what and you can imitate me you are imitating me right now you are mimicking me right you are sitting there so fingers joined is bud fingers open is a flower so bud and flower okay but what i can't teach you is when this flower is floating how you feel at that point of time okay when that flower is blossoming how have you experienced that flower blooming that i will not be able to teach you so that is the difference between a mathematician and an artist 
it is not enough if you only study the shastras and you come and that brings in your point there that expressions is what makes it art forget about classical or folk okay then um, i i'm i'm not sure whether you got to see the gestures hand gestures the people who have joined uh, through zoom have you uh, could you see okay, okay fine yes ma'am all is good so <clears throat> so as drilling home the fact that acquiring the art acquiring the codes is acquiring the craft it is not acquiring the art form okay so the skill is preliminary aspect of shastra it is not the essence of the art shastra is essential to teach any art but as all of us will tell you that it is impossible to teach art it is a feeling it is an expression it is an experience that you have to go through to become an artist that is important the experience is that's where um, i'm i'm i don't know whether you have heard but i'm sure uh, michelle and srinivasji must have like we know we all know that the greater is the pathos the greater is a pain in an artist's life the better the artist becomes because you are going through that experience so that's what creates art now shastra can only direct the student's attention to knowledge but it cannot make him experience wisdom it is much like that proverb that you can lead a horse to drink what like you can lead a horse to the pond but you cannot force the horse to drink water okay so safely we can say that shastra is not art but like a cue sheet to art shastra is also popularly often called science classical learning pay heed to the science or pedagogical learning whereas the non classical learning what as we have been taught to understand is not related to pedagogical learning but rather it depends on paramparik knowledge as you will see in the case of an artist who i have recorded and i will be uh, showing you today he is called nayan jyoti nath he belongs to the suknani ujhapali tradition and he is the grandson of lalitnath ojha a very very famous ojhapali practitioner from assam so he says that i have never really learned it i have never really sat and learned it i have followed him i have been his dynapali and from there he has gone on to become the ojha the governing principle of indian arts or natya as bharat calls it uh, is त्रैलोकस्य सर्वस्य नाट्यम भवनु कीर्तनम नाट्य इज द एक्सोल्टेड इमिटेशन ऑफ द भावस ऑफ द थ्री वर्ल्ड नाट्य इज द डिस्टिल्ड एसेंस ऑफ श्रुति स्मृति एंड सदाचार नाउ वी कम बैक टू द टू टर्म्स रेस्ड अर्लियर नाट्य धर्मी एंड लोक धर्मी इफ यू रिमेम्बर दैट दीज आर द टू टर्म्स दैट आई हैड यूज ऑल्सो अर्लियर इट इज बिलीव दैट क्लासिकल डांस हैज नाट्य or natya dharmi presentation that is stylized presentation as its primary mode of communication along with aspects of loka dharmi which pertains or brings in realism or touch of life into the presentation the section on rasa and natya shastra speaks of 11 cardinal elements that are essential to create natya a few of them i'm not going to go through the entire 11 list it is rasa bhava abhinaya swara ranga gana etc rasa as natya shastra tells us um, again i uh, beg your pardon if you already know about this it's going to be a little boring for you but people who don't know i'll just i'm just going to quickly run through it natya shastra uh, a treatise on indian arts and aesthetics explores the detailed nature of rasa what is rasa the process of experiencing rasa the manner in which they are evoked and the nature of rasananda which is created at the end rasa is the soul of art the purpose of ras, uh, art is to create rasa creative genius guided by aucitya or propriety leads to the production of rasa hence we arrive at a point where panditya is holding hand with pratibha that is acquired knowledge with spontaneous knowledge creating rasa and this is what shastra tells us the next concept is bhava natya shastra talks about eight sthayi bhavas and 33 vyabhichari bhavas which are called transitory emotion or states and eight satvika bhavas 
these are explored in detail in Natya Shastra. Abhinaya. Abhinaya is or Abhinaya or expression as so Abhinaya I always say is much deeper than expression. It is our art of communication. It is our language. There are four kinds of Abhinaya uh, in Indian performing arts. There is Angika which is body uh, the, uh, the Abhinaya which we do through body. There is Vachika, there is Aharya and Sattvika. So uh, unfortunately I have been tied to the desk but otherwise I would have told you. So Angika Abhinaya is where you feel like for example we are taught that when you feel sorrow it is not enough if I just do hand gestures because actually when we cry we don't cry like this. The whole body so the pain of what you're feeling, the body has to react. Similarly, when you feel anger or when you are aggressive, you go forward, you attack, okay? And you become, you expand in anger. So that is Angika Abhinaya, where your body along with your gesture, along with your face is getting involved, okay? Vachika is where you sing or talk and involve uh, sound, Aharya is, of course, dress. And Sattvika is the purest form of Abhinaya. Angika includes Uddhata, which is vigorous aspect of Abhinaya, just what I said, and Sukumara, which is gentle form of Abhinaya. It includes movements of major and minor links, uh, which are known as Anga and Upanga. Like, for example, when I'm showing, uh, say, for example, Shingar, okay? So it is not enough just to show this, but it also has to involve your eyebrow, your eye, your entire being. And even your eyelashes. So all that will get the anga and the upanga. The major limbs, my hand is getting involved. My face is getting involved. My eyelashes are getting involved. My eyebrow is getting involved. My whole being. Okay, so that is Anga and Upanga. The movement vocabulary in Abhinaya includes Thanakas, Charis, Nritta, Hasta, Karana and many more things. All these aspects are connected to prose and poetry which are explored through the Vachika aspect of Abhinaya. The relationship between the <clears throat> sound and the sense, literary aesthetics, that is poetry, uh, grammar, all are explored through Vachika Abhinaya. Now, I'm going to demonstrate, uh, not get up and demonstrate, but share something which will give you a glimpse into uh, what is Vachika Abhinaya. I'm just going to continue using this. So can you see that he's using, he's singing, he's talking. Okay, so this is an example of the Vachika Abhinaya that is happening. And uh, I, I wanted to show you this, but this is going to be a problem because uh, the sound is important. Okay, next we move on to the Aharya aspect. 
Aharyam is related to costume, makeup, ornaments, body color, etc. They all form a part of Aharya Abhinaya. So again, one more small clip. I thought it will be interesting because you can see an artist uh, dressing up. Okay? This is what uh, I was saying about Aharyam. The body color that I mentioned, he has painted his uh, face green. You will have to remember all this, okay? When I talk about Utag a little later, I will ask you what all you saw in the costume. Does this remind you of any form? Had I just shown you the clip, would you have identified it as Otam Thulal or what would you have said this form is? Kathakali, yes. So it is uh, the entire Aharyam when uh, Nambiar who, uh, Kuncha Nambiar who created it, when he uh, created this form, he borrowed the Aharyam from Kathagiri. But of course, there is a difference. If you see that he, he is one of the, you know, he, I would say Kunchanamir was a visionary that he borrowed it. As you said, uh, as I mentioned, he imitated it, but it did not stay at imitation. It went much beyond. It became something which is an art form on its own. So that is what it happened. So now uh, these are the four modes of Abhinaya that we uh, saw. Uh, oh, I missed the Satvika Abhinaya. Close observation of the world along with detailed study of the Shastras and the Kavyas and the treaties is what creates Satvika Abhinaya. Now we come back to the concept of Dharmi, Natya Dharmi and Loka Dharmi. These are the two modes of expression. Natya Dharmi is not exactly always centered in Shastra. And Loka Dharmi is not always entirely devo devoid of Shastra is what my argument is. Loka Dharmi can be said to be belonging to tradition, which adds Sampradaya or Paramparik knowledge to Shastra. It is important for us at this juncture to understand what Bharata calls it as Pravritti. He lists five important ones, Avanti, Dakshinayan, Magadhi, Panchali, and Madhya. So this is exactly what we know as regional knowledge nowadays. This is what he has been calling as pravritti. pravritti. Vrittis added to pravrittis is what creates art form. These are the seeds of Abhinaya and this is how Natya is created. So Natya Dharmi governs Vrittis and can also be traced back to Vritti. What are those? Intensity of Abhinaya, use of speech, gentleness of Abhinaya, and vigor. These are the things which slightly keep varying to create art form. And an intensity or a change of this formula, if I can call this as a formula, a change of this in the formula keeps producing what we understand as Natya Dharmi or Loka Dharmi. That is what is happens.
So by now we have understood that Shastra refers to a well-structured presentation, and that is what is Natya Dharmi, and Loka Dharmi is a part of it as well with regional aspects. Anything which has these characteristics can be identified or called as Shastriya. A Shastra is a well-written set of rules, but it can be unwritten as well. The traditional practices that flow through community consciousness is also Shastra. And this is what we have to keep in mind when we see the traditions like Ojapali. Uh, I think I am almost coming to an end. So what I'm going to quickly do is instead of, uh, you know, going into great detail, I'm... So this is a form known as Deodhani. It is part of uh, Ojapali. And uh, this, again, this is what I mean by paramparic knowledge. This is what they have learned without any set of rules and they are performing it. This is uh, something that they call that um, it is it, it is not a possession exactly. It's not like what we see in Tayyam, but rather it it this particular scene it depicts Manasa's anger, and it it also depicts the virility and the you know the 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 womanhood and this uh, it it is borrowing from the snake worshipping tradition of um, Ojapali. So this brings us to a very alternative perspective at looking at art forms. Folk or regional may not conform to a set of written rules, but they are products of the tastes of people belonging to a particular region or a particular community that has been passed down from generation to generation. This is what Jung calls as collective subconscious in his books. With this being the reality, can we really claim that folk or regional knowledge is diagonally opposite to classical knowledge? If folk is equal to of the people, of a community, of a land, then can I also say that it applies similarly to all our shastras, to all our rituals, to entire Vedic knowledge base, that it is of a community of the people and of land. So this is something that you need to think about when you are looking at any art form. It For me, according to me, it is wrong to create compartments when you look at any art form and say that this is classical and this is non-classical or this is semi-classical. It is wrong to say that Desi lacks Shastric basis it is wrong to say that folk traditions have no set of rules because I'm sure you saw the girls beginning their dance with something like this. This is nothing but a hand gesture or a mudra. So they also have their own traditions and I, okay, I'm, I'm using a wrong word. I cannot say that they are using their own tradition, but they also belong and they borrow from the same source. So we cannot say 
that folk basically has no connection with the Shastras. We can't say that. So I'm going to skip a little bit, go ahead and briefly tell you about Ojapali and Otam Thullal so that you understand. And then I'm going to play two very short clips before ending the lecture. Ojapali is a performative uh, storytelling practice from Assam. It is a uh, it is a, Srimanto Shankardev was one of uh, the great uh, philosophers who started the Bhavna tradition in and around the mid 15th and the mid 16th uh, century in Assam. The first piece that he wrote is called Chinno Yatra. That was such a success when he performed it in front of the 10,000 audience that he went on to create more and more Ankyonats, which are also called the Bhavna uh, art form in Assam. It is said that uh, Hongkardev revisited Natya Shastra in great detail and also borrowed from the Sanskrit theater traditions. But it is also said that he particularly borrowed from one art form which was already there, which is called Ojapali. It is a storytelling practice from Assam. It is found, it is accepted, it is known that it is found in the Darang district of Assam. It is said that Darangi Dharmanarayan, who was one of their kings, who was ruling between 1615 to 1637 in Darang, was an ardent devotee of the snake goddess called Manasa. He patronized a particular poet called Shukobi Narayan Dev to write Padma Puran. Now, the minute I say Padma Puran, it is a very common mistake to think that it is the mainstream Padma Puran. But this is not that particular Padma Puran. Here, the Padma Puran, Padma refers to Manusha because she was born on a lotus. It, she was found in a lotus. So it is about her. So this is what is called a Padma Puran. It is how it also talks about one of the interesting stories that can be found in the mainstream Padma Puran, it is about the rivalry between the snake clan and the eagle clan, that is the snakes and Garuda, which can be found in chapter 47 of the mainstream Padma Puran. It all starts with the rivalry between two sisters, Kadru and Vinata. You can go back and visit the story. You can Google it. Nowadays, Google is very helpful for all these things. This particular interesting story can be found in the Adi Parva of Mahabharat in chapter 16. And it can also be found in the Aranakanda of uh, Ramayan, Valmiki's Ramayan in Canto 35. So when you visit all these, you will see the source. So again, I am drawing your attention to the fact that there is no division. Okay, so there is no division between the region and the classical, the Sanskrit texts and the regional texts. There is no division. The popularity of Ujapali started growing to such a level that Darang culture became uh, identified with Ujapali. The earliest reference of Ojapali can be found in a copper inscription of uh, Banumali Dev in the 9th century. So it was found as early as the 9th century. To understand Ojapali, we have to understand that there are three kinds of Ojapalis. One is Vyoga uh, Ojapali, Shuknani Ojapali, and Ram, uh, Ramayani Ojapali. The Ojapali that we are going to see today is the Shuknani Ojapali. Ojapali is a combination of two words. Ojha is the main character, the one who is like the Sutradhar of Natyashastra, the one who tells the story. So in Ojapali, there is a telling of the story. There is no character development. There is no characterization, unlike a dance form like Bharatanatyam, where we enact the character. In Ojapali, there is a narration of the character. I hope you understand the difference. Like I do not become uh, uh, Manusha. But I just tell the story of Manusha. Interesting aspect of Ojapali is that the Pali is the chorus um, who follows the Oja. The Oja is a central character and Pali is a group of uh, people who sings along with him. Of the Pali, the Daina Pali is, or the right-hand man is the most important uh, person because he and Oja have an interaction. So while Oja is telling the main story, it is the work of the Pali to... Um, tell it uh, to water it down, if I may say so, to bring in contemporary aspects into the discussion. So there is always a dialogue and the Dainapali has to be extremely witty, humorous, spontaneous to be able to add to the main story. So while telling a story, for example, when we, when we were shooting, so when I was shooting this entire thing, what happened was uh, 
the Ojha was telling the story of uh, how uh, Manusha, uh, uh, so this is uh, some other time of, of the camera, I will tell you the story of the, the story of Manusha and the story of Lokinder and Behula. It's a very, very interesting story. Uh, when he was telling that, the Pali added to the fact, oh, our audience today has come in a blue car. So like this, they keep bringing in contemporary uh, nuances contemporary issues into the storytelling aspect which includes regional which includes the pertinent issues of the day which is also seen in uh, Otam Thullal very interestingly when you go to something which is so far apart uh, geographically but has similar features that in Otam Thullal also the artist who is performing will keep bringing in contemporary issues and talk to the audience. So this talking to the audience is something which we get to see in both Ojapali and Otam Thullal. In Ojapali, detailed hastas are used. Along with that, what we see is uh, Brahmari, Utplavanas and Ashtanas as explained in Natya Shastra. The music of Ojapali has ragas, which are um, which has similarity with the Charjapad and Malanchogit and Jagatgit. There are a rag, there is a raga system which is clearly seen in Ojapali. There is something in Ojapali which is known as Ghora Mantra Tara, which ref, uh, which pertains to the Indian classification of Udara, Mudara, and Tara of Indian music system. It uses Khutital, which is a symbol seen in most of the performing arts. In uh, Bharatanatyam, we call it Natuvangam. In uh, like, you know, in every art form, when you go across the Indian subcontinent, you will you see this use of symbols to beat rhythm and keep tal. So in Ojapali, it is called Kutital. Uh, there is also Aharya in Ojapali. They use uh, Pajama or Guri. They wear bangles, Uganti, which is a uh, ring, Nupur and uh, also has a tang uh, tangali, which is a cloth tied around the waist. What you saw in Otam Thullal also, there is something like a, uh, you know, a waist band, which is tied around the waist. So out of all the Ojapalis, the Shuknani Ojapali talks about um, the story of Manusha and how her puja became prevalent in uh, the world. Whereas Ramayani Ojapali talks about Ramayan and the third kind of Ojapali that is uh, the, sorry, the Vyaga Ojapali is talks about Bhagavat, Mahabharat and Harivamsa stories. So there are slight uh, differences between uh, the aharyam of uh, each style, but I will not go into such great detail, but rather I want to show you one more uh, clip uh, before ending. Unfortunately, I won't have so much time to uh, show Otam Thullal. I think you have already seen two. I'm a fast learner. <laughs> Next. What is this? Very good. You are all, you're going to become dance experts. End of this lecture. Okay, this. Start. Tortoise. Okay, next. This is uh, Varaha. Next. Hmm? Yes, Varaha was the wild boar. Mm, next. Next. Yes. Okay, next. Next. I think now he has crossed uh, Vamana also. Yes. This is, uh, I, from what I remember, this is Kalki. Okay. This is uh, Sarpa. 
So now he's going to get into uh, mm. this kurma. This is Balaram. Next. Plowing is this is Varaha, the wild boar. This is a Parashuram because Harpa shows the Sarpa Shank Ramha Ramha Vishnu Vishnu Devi Mudra. This is just to show a child or even Devi at times. So uh, why I showed this is, uh, I, I, I want to now quickly take you through the hastas that I use in Bharatanatyam. So Matsya, Purma, Varaha, okay, Vamana, Vamana, then um, he showed Parashurama, so Parashurama, then Vishnu we use like this, he showed this. Then Shank, Shankha, that is, we show this very similar. So you see that Bharatanatyam, which you immediately answered as a classical dance form, and Ujhapali, which is quote unquote a folk uh, storytelling practice from Assam, has same usage. It is using the same hand gestures which have been used in which has been prescribed in Natya Shastra. So I will, I think I have overshot time greatly. And there was, I could have gone on about a little more about Otam Thullal also. I'm sure Roshan is greatly disappointed that I didn't speak about it, but um, maybe some other time. And uh, so it's my humble supplication and it is what I wanted to come here and talk to you about that Sanskrit is not something which is written and forgotten and kept. It is something that is alive and a living tradition and it is practiced. And also on the flip side, it is not just classical which uses Sanskrit. It is something which is a practicing form of living in Indian subcontinent. It is something which is a part of our lifestyle. It is something that is there in almost all Indian arts and aesthetics, almost in all forms, be it Margi, be it Desi, be it by whatever term you call it, it is prevalent. It is part of that art and aesthetic subconsciousness of India. Thank you so much.